Hello, I'm Clovis Casali in Paris. Welcome to Correspondence, the show bringing you a selection of reports from our teams around the world. This week, we're taking you to Japan on the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima tragedy, to South Africa, where gangs are targeting avocado farms, but first to Russia. The country is seeing a number of its citizens who live abroad rushing back to their homeland, not just to get the chance to see their relatives, but also to get a shot of Sputnik V. The Russian-made coronavirus vaccine was approved by Moscow's health regulators in August last year. Elena Voloshin and Oliver Krag sent us this report. Red Square and its famed Gum department store. Today throng not with the usual tourists, Dusty. but with people who've come for the Sputnik V vaccine. So much Originally from Bangladesh, Azim studies at Moscow's higher school of economics. Today, he's getting his second dose of the vaccine. The first dose was very painful. The next day, I had a fever and my head and my whole body ached. Nevertheless, Azim is delighted to be able to get the jab. It was the first COVID vaccine in the world, and I think it's very good. I know students here from Vietnam, Indonesia, America, Italy. They've also got themselves inoculated. But with Russia's borders still partially closed, it's not easy for foreigners to get here. Most of those coming to Moscow for the vaccine are Russian. There it is. The certificate shows that I have been vaccinated in Russia. And I really hope the German authorities will recognize it when I get back. Alina lives in Germany. She's heading back there after a vaccination visit to Moscow of just over a month. In Germany, the vaccination process will take a year or more. If I were to get vaccinated there, I'd have to go on a waiting list. Here, I didn't even have my Russian passport with me, and I'd got vaccinated in five minutes. Officially, for now, only Russians have the right to get Sputnik V in Russia. But this rule is not enforced in practice. And Vladimir Putin, riding high on the success of the jab, is hoping it will soon conquer the European market. A year ago, tensions were running high at the border between Greece and Turkey with clashes as thousands of migrants were trying to make their way into Europe. At the time, the EU Agency for Border Control, Frontex, was deployed and its forces have been reinforced since. For the first time, the European Union has its own uniformed service. Our correspondents Alexia Kefalas and Natalisa Savarikas got to follow this new Frontex. The sun rises on Evros in the northeast of Greece. The region and its river of the same name are right on the border with Turkey. It's a sensitive area which is heavily guarded by officers of the EU's border police. You can zoom right there. Armed with thermal cameras, binoculars and off-road cars, these European policemen monitor the slightest suspicious activity. Les autorités grecques patrouillent avec les personnels de Frontex. Patrouiller, ça veut dire également se déplacer, surveiller la frontière, tel que uh, les personnels actuellement déployés sont en train de le faire, de manière à détecter tout passage irrégulier sur ce passage de frontière, la frontière turque qui se, qui se trouve uh, juste ici. And just a year ago, this border that seems so peaceful now looked like this. Clashes between Greek and Turkish police officers, thousands of exiled people hoping to reach Europe after Turkey opened its borders are caught in the middle. For 10 days and nights, Greek and European policemen, as well as the army, were on high alert. In the villages of the region, the memory of March 2020 is still very much alive. All of the locals were mobilized to either help with supplies or patrols. Στο βάθο υπάρχουν τα σύνορα τη Ελλάδο με την Τουρκία. Στην ουσία πρόκειται για τα ευρωπαϊκά σύνορα. Η Frontex με τη νέα τη δομή θα προσφέρει τα μέγιστα στην φύλαξη των ευρωπαϊκών συνόρων. Και να σα πω τώρα ότι η νέα τη μορφή σαφώ την ενδυναμώνει, υποβοηθά το έργο τη ελληνική αστυνομία και μεταφέρει στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση τα πραγματικά γεγονότα και την πραγματική διάσταση του προβλήματο. As the villages in the north sleep with one eye open, fishermen in the islands are on the watch. In the past months, some have been clashing with the Turkish colleagues in the Aegean Sea. 
Last summer, the same area was full of Turkish warships escorting vessels surveying the deep blue for possible oil and gas. March 13th marks the 10 year anniversary of the earthquake and tsunami that triggered the Fukushima tragedy. It was the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl and of course a traumatic event for Japan. Thousands were killed, many forced to flee their homes. Constantin Simon looks at how Japan is recovering a decade later. Atsushi Fujita lost almost everything 10 years ago. The tsunami swept his fishing boat three kilometers inland. He survived, but his brother and colleagues were killed. There were dead bodies in the water. I even remember seeing the floating body of a man wearing a kitchen apron. The town of Rikuzen Takata was among the places hit hardest by the tsunami. 10% of the population died, and 90% of its fishing fleet was destroyed. Today, local fishermen are protected by an eight meter high seawall. At first, the wall felt oppressive. I was stressed out all the time. It was like being in a kind of prison, day in, day out. But now I don't think it's possible to destroy the wall. It's better to learn to live with it. Fujita has reason to feel optimistic. His oyster cultivation business is booming, a sign that the ocean can give as well as take away. The tsunami cleaned the soil on the seabed, so now it only takes two years for oysters to reach their best. Before the disaster, it took three years. They grow really quickly. It's said that the tsunami was a once in a 1,000 year event, but it feels like the sea has become 1,000 years younger. The sea can be generous. Fujita is living proof of the resilience of the people of Tohoku. It makes me feel hungry. They're bigger than my tummy. In Fukushima, people who had to flee their homes after the nuclear disaster have returned to open a traditional restaurant. Ten years on, it's a symbol of recovery, attracting diners of all ages. People in other countries don't really understand what's happening in Fukushima. I spent some time living abroad and people would ask me if anyone was living here. I want to tell people that life here isn't what they think. Look around, we're alive and happy. This is what Fukushima is like today. It's unlikely that life in Fukushima will ever return to normal. But a decade on, people here are slowly rebuilding, helped by an unshakable community spirit. Now to South Africa, where mafia bosses are eyeing what is being labeled as green gold. The domestic and foreign demand for avocados has increased hugely, leading gangs to target large farms. Worried avocado producers are forced to invest in private security. Caroline Dumais and Sam Bradpiece have this report. The George Valley close to Zanin has long been a paradise for avocado farmers, but it's turning into a battleground. Private security companies patrol night and day, keeping an eye on the area's green gold. Avocados, macadamia nuts and timber have become prime targets for organized criminals. Some farmers have lost up to 20% of their produce in the past couple of years. Like whether it's fencing, they have the methods to cut it, to climb over it, to crawl under it, but to get in, so they are very determined. With nearly 15,000 hectares of orchards, South Africa is one of the biggest avocado producers in the world. Three quarters of its farmers report suffering from theft. Avocados once stolen are incredibly difficult to trace. The farmers have struggled to find a solution. Uh, what people have tried was to micro dot it where you get a unique number and you actually spray the fruit. That would definitely be a positive way of, of proving um, that the fruit came from you. Ian's farm resembles many others. The 45 hectare property is surrounded by an electric fence and alarm system, allowing him to react fast. His neighbor, Sandile, faces the same issues, 
But as a macadamia nut farmer, his product is even more appealing to criminals. These are our nuts. 45 rands a kg. It's a lot of money, so this becomes just gold for everyone. It most definitely give you, gives you a sleepless night that you've spent the whole uh, season in the rain, putting fertilizer, irrigation, paying employees, and someone just on that, on that, just about when you're about to harvest and get you the worth for your money, and someone just comes and picks it up there in the lands or in the bins. Private security operators are beginning to better understand how the thieves work. These bananas is where they used to hide to wait for the guard to, to pass. When he passed, it's where they enter. They came and pick, 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 pick. One ton of avocado sold in South Africa is worth about a thousand euros, three times that when exported. Avocado theft is also on the rise in Mexico, New Zealand and Spain. As long as global demand soars, the fruit will remain a ripe target. That's all for this edition of Correspondence. I leave you with images of Paris's cultural sector still standing in these times of coronavirus. Galleries remain open, much to the delight of visitors. Renaud Lefort took this cultural stroll in Paris for us. Thank you all for watching. See you soon and stay safe. <laughs>